today the title of my talk is uh, one health and i would be walking you through the various events like the zoonotic spillovers from animals to humans which have happened in the past describing a few events in greater details which have happened in india and also i would uh, then take you through the modalities of surveillance that we need to set up now to improve our pandemic preparedness and how we need to work holistically with various stakeholders and partners to achieve the goal of comprehensive surveillance in a one health approach so there are various known modes of spread of infectious diseases the most common mode of spread of new infectious diseases that we are now seeing uh, since the last i would say two decades is the close human to animal interface which is also known as zoonotic spillover and there have been several uh, diseases either new or reemerged diseases which have spread through this route then the other most common mode of spread is physical contact with an infected person contact with blood body fluids or secretions of an infected person then in the recent past due to increase air sea and land travel there has been lot of spread of infectious diseases due to movement of people across the borders there are several diseases which have spread rampantly by vectors or reservoirs like bats mosquitoes even wild birds or migratory birds then there are instances when where diseases have spread through animal trade as well so if we look at the uh, what have been the zoonotic diseases in the recent past then globally about 1 million cases of illnesses and millions of death occur every year from zoonotic infections and 60% of these are emerging infectious diseases that are reported globally as zoonoses and there are over 30 new human pathogens which have been detected in the last 3 decades perhaps due to the various modalities that i uh, elucidated in the last slide 75% of which have originated in animals which is a huge cause of concern for all of us now uh, this this is a running line which shows that since the last 3 decades how different infections have spread from animals to humans starting from bovine spongiform encephalitis hendra nipa marburg sars sus uh, then avian influenza outbreaks human influenza outbreaks ebola mers corona virus then zika and of course covid-19 which has wrecked the entire world and very recently in 2022 we saw a global spread of monkeypox disease now when we talk of a one health approach why do we talk of one health the reason is that you are seeing that we have several zoonotic infections which have rampantly spread from animals to humans through various modes be it travel be it vectors be it close contact with animals and and several other modes so unless we follow a one health approach that that is we are cognizant of health uh, in animals in humans in environment in vectors unless all that is achieved we cannot ensure safety to mankind so for that it is very important to follow a very comprehensive one health approach be it in terms of detection treatment disease prevention and various other aspects so this is a slide which depicts that how the there has been spillage of infections in the recent past from animals to humans uh this is one slide with which depicts that there was spread of kaisanu forest disease which is a disease which is found in humans and uh, first spread from uh, kaisanu forest in karnataka from monkeys infected monkeys to humans now this disease was also found in tigers in bandipur tiger reserve in india and the source of infection couldn't be known but this is not a population which inherently get, gets kfd either it was reverse zoonosis from uh, humans to animals or contact with some infected monkeys but the cause could not be deciphered then there was first case of crimean congo hemorrhagic fever in a district in rajasthan sirohi district in rajasthan 
which had actually never seen uh, cases of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. And we all know that there are a lot of cattle species which are asymptomatically infected with Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. And the, the ticks that reside on these cattle can bite humans and spread infection to them. So again, this could have been the possible route of transmission. Then we saw an outbreak of canine distemper virus in Asiatic lions of Gujarat, wherein uh, the canine distemper virus was responsible for death of several Asiatic lions. And this uh, etiology was confused as uh, measles. And later on, ICMR National Institute of Virology uh, came out that this is canine distemper virus. Again, the source, uh, most commonly dogs are infected with uh, this uh, canine distemper virus. Maybe the lions would have got infected by eating some dogs or close contact. So that again uh, remained a question mark. Then, of course, uh, most of us know about the recent Nipah virus outbreaks, which were uh, seen in Kerala. Uh, the first outbreak, major outbreak was in 2018, then 2019. And even in 2021, we saw cases of Nipah virus disease. Again, we have been, uh, again, a Zika virus infection, which is also a, a zoonotic infection was seen uh, in mosquitoes, which were transmitting uh, Zika virus from one individual to the other. So this is also a zoonotic disease, which spread very quickly uh, 2014 onwards. And scrub typhus, which was known as a very, very uh, covert disease, nobody used to even check for it, has now spread its tentacles uh, to most parts of the country. And it reflects as very serious disease in terms of acute encephalitis syndrome and acute respiratory distress syndrome. So these are uh, diseases which never caught the attention of people. But now uh, with them spreading across various domains, they have become so important to uh, look at in uh, routine diagnostic testing. Then there have been instances when though avian influenza spillover to humans in India has been a rare instance, but still we could find a case of human, uh, a child who was infected with H5N1. He was an immunocompromised child, but he was infected with the virus and had a documented history of contact with poultry. Then we also, uh, and, and, and this child uh, was of acute myeloid leukemia. We also could find a novel uh, resort, reassortant avian influenza H4N6 virus from environmental samples in Maharashtra, which again was a cause of concern. And similarly, we could again find H9N2 infected child in uh, a sample from Delhi. So there have been reported instances where avian influenza spillover to humans has also been documented, which again remains a cause of concern because avian influenza is a highly pathogenic uh, virus. This is just to give you a glimpse of uh, avian influenza outbreak that was investigated by the uh, National Institute of Virology of Indian Council of Medical Research in 2016. And this is the zoo or the National Zoological Park investigations at Delhi. And you can see how the people are trying to collect samples of dead birds and even their droppings, which were later on examined uh, for the presence of the virus. And uh, this is how the virus evolved in, uh, uh, and this was the genesis of H5N8 outbreak in Delhi Zoo. Now, this is to give you a glimpse of how, how quickly viruses can evolve and they can spread globally. So this is a published paper of 2006. And in 2005, we had a major concern of avian influenza spreading to all corners of the world. And again, its origin was basically from China. And this uh, figure shows you that how quickly within a year's time, the virus spread uh, to uh, many parts of the world and mainly through migratory birds, wild bird trade, as well as poultry farming. And in India, where in very recent times, we have detected avian influenza outbreaks at the animal-human interface in states like Kerala, Gujarat, and Maharashtra. 
And uh, at two instances in 2021, it was H5N8 outbreak. And in Gujarat, uh, we also found an H5N1 outbreak. So the point that I'm trying to make is that it is very important to maintain a watch on these emerging viruses through a very robust surveillance so that we are not caught unaware as we were in COVID-19 and we have a very, very major outbreak because influenza viruses have a potential to mutate very fast and cause massive outbreaks. And this is to give you a glimpse of how fast the H1N1 or the swine flu of 2009 spread. It quickly emerged. Uh, the, the source of infection definitely is not known in this case. Where, where uh, did it emerge? But then it quickly spread to all parts of the world and caused a major pandemic in 2009. And now this H1N1 2009 strain is a part of our seasonal influenza strains and is routinely detected. Then, of course, COVID-19 is a story which is uh, known to everyone how fast the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus emerged and spread to all parts of the world. Similarly, uh, the Ebola virus outbreak of 2014 in Africa was one of the major, most major outbreaks of Ebola that we have seen till now. And the whole world was at uh, vigil because uh, this also spreads pretty fast. But uh, the, the good part about the virus is that it does not have a very, very high transmission potential. So, so far, the Ebola outbreaks have been restricted to different countries in Africa. And uh, of course, uh, cases which have been uh, imported into other countries from Africa have been documented, but there have not been any massive outbreaks in other parts of the world. But we definitely need to keep a watch on this virus how it evolves in future and how much it will spread is something which is not known and needs to be continuously monitored. Similarly, the chikungunya virus outbreak in 2006, after a quiescence of almost 32 years, this virus re-emerged after significant evolution and it spread to all parts of the world. And India also witnessed a, a major outbreak of chikungunya virus in 2006, and still we keep on seeing periodic outbreaks after three or five months of this virus. It evolves and again it causes outbreaks. Similarly, the Zika virus, uh, which was a relatively very quiescent virus existing in nature in Africa in, since 1947. And then first human case isolated in 1954 in Nigeria. It remained a relatively innocuous virus for several decades. But suddenly in 2014, we started seeing outbreaks in, uh, in the uh, uh, various parts of the world. And then in Brazil in 2015, where it started causing microcephaly in children, it became a major cause of concern. And it was declared as a public health emergency of international concern by WHO in early 2016, and all the countries were advised to quickly set up surveillance and start monitoring the spread of this virus and the impacts that it causes, including vector surveillance. So this is how uh, we have seen it. The previous slide just gave you a glimpse of how the infections spread and how uh, quickly they spread the zoonotic infections. And the populations are always caught unaware. So the whole idea now is this is a slide which has been derived from the World Bank document. In the topmost panel, that is figure A, you can see that, first of all, there is an amplification of a, a pathogen in different species, be it uh, uh, non-human primates or uh, bats or uh, uh, reservoirs like rats and then monkeys. So these are uh, the most common reservoirs uh, for, for infection and even pigs where infection uh, can spill over from uh, animals to humans. So first they get infected. The pathogen amplifies in these uh, hosts, non-human hosts for a certain period of time. And then uh, after the pathogen has established itself in these uh, animals, through vectors it spreads over to uh, humans. 
and this is the point either either through domestic animals to humans or directly to humans if they are in contact with wildlife so this is how the infection spills over so now if you look at the panel b it says that what you should do uh, to prevent the spread of such infections to humans so if we have a forecasting readiness at the first peak that you see where the a uh, virus or the pathogen is multiplying in the animals if we have a way to detect this uh, particular uh, multiplication and we have a forecasting model we can prevent it here then at the time when the pathogen is spilling over through either vectors or or uh, by contact with the wildlife of the domestic animals or humans if we have good detection tools then we can detect this spillover and if we have a robust vector surveillance or domestic animal surveillance we can do a very very quick detection so when this detection happens we are able to prevent the spillover from the vectors or the animals to the humans so these are the uh, tools in which we need to invest now in terms uh, if we really want to uh, protect ourselves from future pandemics pandemics will continue to threaten us they will continue to come but we as humans need to improve our readiness improve our detection tools so that we are able to identify a threat very early during its emergence so that's the key now if we want to achieve all this then first of all we really need to strengthen our surveillance now there are two types of surveillance one is the indicator based surveillance which is a very traditional way of uh, reporting diseases to public health officials and then uh, it reports specific diseases from healthcare providers uh, to public health officials because public health officials need to take policy decisions and the cases are seen by the healthcare providers so there has to be a close link between the uh, two of them then structured information Uh, is obtained through this surveillance because our generally our surveillance forms and questionnaires are very very standardized then we also need this is indicator based surveillance exists in our country through the integrated disease surveillance program what we lack is the event based surveillance now event based surveillance means that we have a machinery for surveillance which acts on the basis of reports stories rumors media reports unstructured information so the, there are various sources then community reportings school teacher reportings so there has to be a surveillance mechanism which picks up unstructured information and tries to process it and find finds out whether it is useful to examine such events so this is uh, one uh, thing on which we need to invest that is on event based surveillance and this is a, a table which tells you what is the difference between event based surveillance and indicator based surveillance but the point that i want to make here is that both these surveillance are very important to detect any unknown disease or a novel emerging pathogen and this is how it operates that both at uh, and and especially if we are looking at a one health approach we really need to have both indicator based surveillance and event based surveillance at the level of the uh, on the human side as well as the animal side so if you look at this uh, figure it tells you that these uh, surveillance uh, both event based and indicator based surveillance need to be present as i said on the human and the animal side at national level at sub national level at even intermediate levels and local levels which may be going down to the level of a block or a village and when uh, we have these surveillance systems set up it is also very important to understand that we should be able to process the information that is coming out of these surveillance systems so we should be able to pick up signals we should be able to process the signals and we should be able to make public health decisions based on the signals that we are picking up any information which is gathered and not reviewed not processed has no meaning 
So we really need to have a very robust system of processing the information as well. Now, uh, if we look at few initiatives that ICMR has taken, uh, which can be used definitely for a One Health based approach, that is a state of art biosafety level four uh, facility at ICMR National Institute of Virology, Pune. This is the highest level of uh, uh, highest level of laboratory biosafe laboratory that we have across the world. And this is the only facility available in India where we can handle any unknown pathogen or high-risk pathogens. Uh, there are existing collaborations with the uh, animal husbandry, environment and forest, veterinary college, state governments, as well as the National Center for Disease Control. And the, on, the figure on the right-hand side shows you that what are the uh, institutes which have been funded by ICMR for undertaking One Health research. This slide depicts the very recent spread of monkeypox disease in uh, across the world. Now, I want to talk a little about the Nipah virus disease, how it emerged, how it spread in India, and how it was tackled. So when we look at the monkey uh, Nipah virus disease, so it was first identified in uh, the year 1999 in Malaysia and as an outbreak of respiratory and neurological disease in pigs and encephalitis in humans. First of all, it was confused as Japanese encephalitis, but later on it was found that it's a new virus of the measles family, and it was na named as Nipah on the name of the village in Malaysia where it emerged. And then uh, it started causing uh, distinct outbreaks in Bangladesh in humans. And in India, four outbreaks have been documented in uh, 2001, 2007 in West Bengal. And thereafter, repeated outbreaks in Kerala have been demonstrated. But between this, there was an outbreak in Singapore, which was caused by uh, the trade of pigs. Here you can see that the pigs were imported from uh, Malaysia to Singapore and that led to a, a, a focal outbreak in the people who were handling the pigs. And then it was identified as the source of infection was the pigs and they were culled. Now, the problem with the Nipah virus disease is that it is spread by Teropus bats. And if you look at the flight range of Teropus bats, this is a figure which shows that they actually fly from the tip of Africa to the entire Southeast Asia region and in, even including Australia. So they, they fly so, their flight range is so big that they can really uh, spread diseases. And Nipah is not the only disease which is spread by bats, even diseases like Ebola and several respiratory viruses, novel viruses are spread by, and, and of course, rabies is spread by bats. So, uh, since they have such a big flight range, they really have the potential to cross borders and spread diseases. Now, this is a list of uh, the Nipah virus uh, outbreaks in India. After that, 2021 outbreak has been added. Now, I, I like to speak a little bit about the uh, first identified outbreak. In 2001, we really could not identify the Nadia outbreak, what was the cause of the outbreak. But in Siliguri outbreak in 2007, we could distinctly see that the index case who was a 35-year-old male spread the infection to three of the family members and one of the paramedical staff. And when we looked at the uh, uh, genome sequences of this particular outbreak, we could see that we had a very high sequence identity with the Bangladesh isolate, which was more than 99% identity. And all the uh, the index case as well as the contacts, all of them died. So this was almost 100% mortality in this outbreak, which was a great cause of concern. Then subsequently, we had an outbreak of Nipah virus in Kozikode and Malapuram districts, which was one of the uh, really uh, concerning outbreaks with an 89% mortality. 23 cases were reported uh, in this outbreak wherein 18 were lab confirmed, 22 had uh, acute neurological sequelae, and 16 on the 18 lab confirmed cases died with a case fatality rate of 89%. Now, source of the infection in the primary case remained unknown. So we never knew 
where the infection came from and this is how uh, like uh, the first person that is number 1 who came from a village in kerala really infected he was taken to the hospital wherein he infected uh, like all the contacts uh, which uh, which the people who came in contact they were the family people as well as the healthcare professionals they were all infected by this person then since he deteriorated he was taken to a medical college and in the medical college in the casualty as well as the ct scan waiting room again this person infected several healthcare workers as well as the hospital uh, or as well as the hospitalized patients and this infection uh, trend continued from 3rd of may to 16th of may wherein this person really infected several people so here you can see that how one infected case really infected many other people the reason being because like nobody in kerala had detection capacity for nipa at that point in time and by the time they really identified it is a confirmed nipa virus disease this person had infected many other people and most of them died so here i want to highlight that how important it is to really uh, detect the spread of infection in a very early stage in terms of having very strong laboratory capacity to detect what the infection is and to take appropriate precautions in terms of isolation isolating the patient wearing proper ppe while handling the patient which were not taken during the nipa virus outbreak in turn killing so many people uh, both healthcare workers family uh, people family contacts as well as the uh, hospital people who were hospitalized for other illnesses so this is how uh, like uh, between 3rd of may and 27th of may how the infection continued to spread uh, creating probable cases and only two of them survived rest of them died again this is the incidence of uh, uh, cases uh, of nipa cases by date of onset and type of contact uh, it's uh, i would not go into the details here and now this is the slide which dip, which depicts that how the infection emerged and spread like it emerged in kozi kot many people got infected and ultimately they traveled and spread it to mallapuram district as well now after the uh, nipa virus outbreak in kerala there was a huge concern that since this virus was restricted only to bangladesh and west bengal which is very close to uh, Bang uh, bangladesh and they share the borders suddenly how this virus came to kerala so there was lot of speculation is it bioterrorism is it release of the virus to kerala and and there were no answers so it became extremely important to find the source of infection to understand where is it coming from so there were lot of interviews there were lot of qualitative interviews to understand that what do they think what were their consumption practices did they come in contact with bats did they uh, eat any half eaten fruit or where the uh, index case acquired the infection from so fortunately after lot of uh, fact finding uh, again icmr niv pune did bat surveys over there and they caught trapped bats from the localities from where the index case was found and uh, to our surprise we saw that when we compared the full gene sequence of humans which you can see on the left hand side and the partial gene sequence from the bats there was again a very very close similarity more than 99% similarity between the two sequences and also a close match with the bangladesh sequence uh, to the extent ranging from 85 to 96% but definitely this also indicated that we were not exactly similar to the bangladesh strain as we were uh in the west bengal outbreaks we had a slight divergence from the bangladesh strain which indicated that nipa virus is somewhere multiplying within our milieu within our environment within the bats that visit india or migrate to india so it becomes imperative to keep on seeing that how uh, we we keep on uh, monitoring the situation in bats and keep on doing bat surveys uh, within our country we also did again uh, to do more 
fact finding in terms of identifying the risk factors we also did an unmatched case control study whereas cases were all selected uh, select we, we selected all confirmed uh, cases and controls were selected from the list of 2600 primary and secondary contacts which we had enlisted during the nipa outbreak we did in depth interviews and did data collection and calculated the odds ratio against confidence intervals of 95% our sample size was 18 cases and 72 controls in 1 is to 4 ratio but the study concluded that the significant risk factors were for for acquisition of nipa infection were contact with body fluids with an odds of 15 Uh, then presence in the same room as the infected patient with an odds of 4.5 then the contact duration of more than 24 hours in hospital again with an odds of more than 4 then we also uh, wanted to understand that what is the prevalence of nipa antibodies in co- close contacts of confirmed cases so our uh, objective was to understand whether we have any asymptomatic cases of nipa because this was something uh, a research question which was unanswered and nobody knew how many asymptomatic cases we have for nipa so our study revealed that uh, really uh, in in terms of nipa virus infection there were only uh, three uh, people who were zero positive who had a documented contact with, uh, from with a nipa patient so out of the 279 contacts which we checked for antibodies we could only find three people who were zero positive so this gives us an indication that most of the nipa virus disease is asymptomatic most of the nipa virus disease is symptomatic we don't have asymptomatic infection to a significant proportion so in our study there were only 1.1% individuals who did not exhibit symptoms but still exhibited antibodies which is a very very low uh, proportion as compared to other diseases if you look at dengue or even covid 19 where 60 to 80% of the infection is asymptomatic so this gives us a clue on how to investigate nipa virus outbreaks in future i would like to stay here and i would like to emphasize that the reason why i took you through the nipa virus outbreak and how we investigated it what kinds of studies we conducted is to give you an idea that whenever we have a, a a new outbreak or an outbreak of a novel pathogen these are the kind of exercises that we have to do to understand the spectrum of disease the risk factors proportion of asymptomatic infection then source of infection then also augmenting our laboratory capacity for early detection in future so these are the steps which are required and we need to gear up in future with these steps to be able to combat Uh, epidemics and pandemics so again this is a slide which really depicts that zoonotic infections can really come either from uh, the uh, natural flora and fauna wild animals poultry domestic animals horses animal trading and then uh, first of all after the they establish well in the animal reservoirs they start spilling over to humans and it takes time to uh, establish for these pathogens to establish themselves for for uh, human to human transmission so it doesn't happen immediately it happens after a few or a considerable number of cycles of animal replication then animal to human spill over and then eventually uh, the pathogen tries to establish itself for, for human to human transmission now what are the impact of epidemics impacts are huge they lead to political instability the impact the uh, gdp of the country they lead to loss of employment and livelihood there is a decline in foreign investment and definitely economy of the country is affected then the people who are quarantined or in camps or isolated they really undergo a huge psychosocial impact there's a stigmatization of households healthcare workers burial teams which we have repeatedly seen in covid-19 as well as nipa then there is a diversion of development spending so whatever fund is allocated for development is diverted towards uh, 
combating the pandemic and it affects the development overall development of the country there is an impact on education there are school dropouts and when there is increase in economic crisis there is definitely poverty which leads to increase in crime and riots so the impacts of epidemics are many and we should make all concerted efforts to really avert any future epidemics or pandemics to a large scale and the answer is that we really need to prepare ourselves for future epidemics and pandemics through a one health approach now when we talk of one health approach it will involve uh, setting up surveillance very robust sentinel surveillance at the human level animal level vector as well as environment now uh, there are there is a one health group at the level of the uh, psa or the principal scientific advisor to the prime minister when in all the sectors are being brought together now and surveillance is is, is being set up at all levels both in terms of organized sector as well as unorganized sector like organized sector if i talk of then icmr is planning to set up surveillance at zoos wildlife sanctuaries national parks abattoirs and farms where we have a very well characterized population human population that is regularly coming into contact with animals and they uh, definitely uh, are a source where we can detect any zoonotic spillover so surveillance is being set up at these sites then definitely it is also equally important to look at the unorganized sector in terms of livestock in human dwellings and wet markets and definitely food safety animal surveillance is equally important now this is a concept diagram which shows that what icmr is trying to do in terms of setting up surveillance so as i said that we are trying to set up surveillance both in zoos wildlife sanctuaries which is depicted here bird sanctuaries and uh, uh, and also set up environmental surveillance to pick up humans who are showing early signs of any kinds of disease whether it's a respiratory disease whether it is acute fever jaundice conjunctivitis fever with rash acute encephalitis so we'll pick up these individuals who are exhibiting uh, some kind of syndromic illness and through a comprehensive laboratory approach we are going to test them and whatever uh, remains undiagnosed we will sequence them to understand that what is the ultimate pathogen so there is a, an effort to develop a novel pathogen discovery platform which will enable us to understand what new pathogens are we seeing at the animal human interface for all these exercises like whenever we have a sample with us of a of an ill patient it is very important to have a very robust laboratory capacity for detecting that sample what is it and uh, definitely for this we have done a comprehensive mapping of pathogenic agents with a possibility of zoonotic spillover we are strengthening our laboratories to have diagnostic capacities for these pathogens which have a potential of zoonotic spillover so what i'm trying to say is that first a comprehensive list has been developed what all pathogens can jump from animal to humans and then we are trying to supplement our labs with diagnostic kits and methods for detecting those spillover pathogens we are developing new algorithms and also trying to institute quality control mechanisms at our lab so that we don't do any wrong diagnosis then we are also laying down case definitions for various syndromes of zoonotic pathogens and mapping the relevant signs and symptoms developing robust case report forms to capture demographic epidemiological and clinical information which is extremely important because if you detect a novel infection you really need to go back to the communities the households and see where the infected patient resides and if there is a need to quarantine the area or dev or uh, like make it a containment zone it is very important to do take all these public health measures to contain the spread of infection as we all have seen in covid-19 then uh, the most important thing uh, to identify novel pathogen is that whatever diagnostic assays and kits we have are able to detect pathogens that are known to us now something which is unknown we don't have kits for 
so the uh, next generation sequencing and capacity for novel pathogen discovery at the level of wet lab and having very innovative bioinformatics pipelines for data generation analysis storage is very important to identify any novel threat uh, due to an infectious pathogen that we may see in future again uh, if we talk of the infrastructure that we have for uh, like having all these capacities of good labs of good surveillance of novel pathogen discovery this is the uh, rich network that we have available at icmr and in collaboration with, with various stakeholders and partners we have virus research and diagnostic laboratories across the country we have biosafety level 3 labs which are uh, very well aligned with the biosafety level 4 lab which is the highest lab as i said we also have an indigenous mobile biosafety level 3 lab which can be taken to places like I, as i showed you the nipah virus outbreak in kerala where there was a delay in diagnosis so now we have a mobile lab which can be taken to any part of the country and diagnosis can be given in a few hours and the outbreak can be contained very very quickly then we have next generation sequencing facilities at almost 52 sites and these are public health laboratories which are working on infectious pathogens during covid-19 pandemic we have a uh, have scaled our molecular uh, testing capacity to almost 3300 labs and now we are also coming up with a dedicated one health center at nagpur which was recently inaugurated by the honorable prime minister and will specifically focus on one health related surveillance research diagnostic capacity and innovative solutions and we also have upcoming four a uh, national institute of virology like institutions in different parts of the country which will again uh, focus on emerging reemerging viral infections particularly of one health importance this is to just give you a glimpse of the mobile bsl3 laboratory that we have this is a complete solution in terms of uh, a negative air pressure system and a biological waste decontamination system it has all uh, geo tagging biometric cctv and all modern uh, uh, mod it's a modern equipped facility these are the interiors where you can see that there are biosafety cabinets rt pcr machines ice making machines centrifuges uh, autoclaves everything that you need to uh, go and test in times of outbreaks at the sites recently who has also released a one health joint action plan which i encourage all of you to go and look at this is a very initial document which lays down certain action tracks which all countries must follow uh, to have a very comprehensive one health based surveillance and this talks about strengthening of healthcare systems then a risk reduction uh, for emerging epidemics and pandemics then uh, also controlling and eliminating zoonotic and vector borne infections then strengthening the assessment management and communication of food safety risks then curbing the silent spread of antimicrobial resistance and integrating the environment component also into one health so i would encourage all of you to go and see this now uh, ultimately i would like to uh, enumerate the key actions which are required at our end in collaboration with all relevant stakeholders and partners are setting up surveillance for early detection of uh, uh, diseases of uh, epidemic pandemic potential as i have shown you in my presentation strengthen laboratory infrastructure to be able to test and detect novel pathogens then it is very important to train our workforce and also sustain the trained workforce we should not lose them then strengthen healthcare infrastructure in terms of having good isolation facilities good uh, well trained staff uh, in terms of handling patients who are critically ill uh, with a very highly pathogenic infectious diseases it is extremely important to have a multi stakeholder engagement because when we talk of one health it cannot be one organization or agency alone it is many together then have a strong research infrastructure to be able to give innovative solutions to curb the spread of uh, epidemics and pandemics 
appropriate governance is a must. We should have very strong, well-defined governance uh, pathways to avoid any confusion and delays in our uh, execution processes. Political support is extremely important without which nothing can be achieved. Then we also need to enter into robust international collaborations to be able to uh, draw upon the experiences, knowledge of many other countries who may be uh, doing something much better than us. So One Health involves everyone. Uh, and the key for One Health is collaborating, communicating, and coordinating, as well as working together. So that's all from my side, and thank you very much.